God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Pastor Nick. Thank you, worship team. Well, a Navy cruiser was gliding by a deserted island in the South Pacific one day when the crew spotted a column of smoke coming from the shore. They turned off course and as they drew near to the island they could see a lone castaway in tattered clothing wildly waving his arms at them. When the landing party reached the shore the castaway dropped to his knees and he thanked God for finally answering his prayers. As they prepared to leave together, the castaway went into a grass hut to gather together his meager belongings. But curiously, the crew noticed that there were two other huts, one on either side of the one the man went into. The lieutenant asked him, what are all these huts? The castaway replied, well, this one is my home and the one on the left is my church. The lieutenant was a little bit surprised. He said, well, what's the other one? The castaway shrugged and he said, oh, that's my old church. I didn't like the atmosphere there, so I left. <laughs> As the saying goes, if you ever find the perfect church, don't join it because you will ruin it. <laughs> this year we've been reading the letters of Paul together. We've been listening to hear what the Holy Spirit wants to say to us through these letters. We read the letters of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Paul's first letters. Then we read the letter of Galatians, which is most likely his next letter. Today, we're beginning the first letter to the church in Corinth. When Paul sat down to write to this very messy church, he didn't write an ordinary letter. He wrote a letter from heaven. A letter that was inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak across time and distance to you and to me. Looking at the opening lines of this letter, I find a desperately needed word of encouragement for the church at large today. Even in the very best of churches, like harvest time, there is always a need to grow in unity. And even in the most dysfunctional of churches, there is always hope in Jesus Christ for unity to be restored. Unity was one of the major problems in the church at Corinth, and it is one of the major problems in the church today. But looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I find a simple recipe for unity, and I want to share it with you quickly. A simple recipe for unity. First of all, start with a good measure of humility. A good measure of humility. Early in our married life, Denise and I used to play a little game called who's on the phone you see way back in the stone age when we got married there was no such thing as caller id so when denise would answer the phone i would listen to her end of the conversation and i would try to guess who was calling and what they were talking about i could tell by her tone of voice whether she was talking to a family member or a close friend or a distant acquaintance or maybe a sales call i could tell by the terms of endearment she used whom it might be you know that's really a lot like listening to paul's letters we're only privy to half of the conversation we can hear paul's responses but we don't know what has been said by the folks on the other end of the line so we have to put on our detective hats, as it were, and we have to piece things together by carefully looking at everything Paul says. There were problems in the church at Corinth, but the precise nature of those problems is a little bit of a mystery. Actually, the letter that we call 1 Corinthians is the third piece of correspondence that we know of that passed between Paul and this church. Paul mentions that he had written a previous letter to correct problems in the church. We don't know what his letter said, but we can safely surmise that the church did not appreciate the letter because they wrote a letter back to Paul outright defying his instructions. In response to that letter, Paul wrote this letter that we call 1 Corinthians, and believe me, Paul was hot. 
We don't know what the first two letters said, but listening carefully to Paul, there's a lot that we can piece together. It appears that the major problem in the church was division. There were internal divisions to be sure, but more seriously, the church had become estranged from Paul. It also appears that the source of the division was spiritual pride, and the source of the spiritual pride was bad theology. So immediately, in the opening lines of this letter, Paul appeals for humility. Here's a tweetable line for this morning. Spiritual pride breeds division, but humility brings unity. How does Paul appeal for humility? First of all, Paul says, think humbly about yourself. The Corinthians had grown a little too big for their britches. Because they had eloquent teachers, because they moved in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, they thought that they had outgrown other Christians, and especially they thought that they had outgrown Paul, their father in the Lord. So Paul says, whoa, whoa, how about a little humility here? Brothers, think of what you were when God called you. Not many of you were wise or powerful or royal by birth. God chose the foolish things, the weak things, the oppressed, the despised nothings to outshine the A-listers so that no one can boast before him. It is because of him you are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying, for one thing, you are who you are and you have what you have only because of God. God called you. God chose you. It is because of him that you're in Christ Jesus. Early in chapter 1, Paul says, in him you've been enriched in every way. In him you lack no spiritual gift. You see, there's no room anywhere for spiritual pride because everything you are and every gift you have is all of His grace. You have it not because you are more worthy than someone else, not because you were purer in heart, not because you were more moral or kind or conscientious or generous. It's only because God chose you. A little further down, Paul says, tell me, what do you have that you didn't receive as a gift from God? And if you did receive it as a gift, why do you boast as if you did not? Paul wrote to the Romans, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. God has given you what you have. And if that wasn't enough to keep you humble, Paul goes on to say this. God chose you specifically because you were a hard case. Paul says God has chosen the oppressed, the marginalized, the underdogs. God has chosen the at-risk kids. God has chosen not people who were upwardly mobile themselves, but those who were in a downward spiral in their lives. If you look at the history of the church, you'll see it's true. God has a wonderful pattern of always choosing the least in every generation. And he does such a spectacular work of grace in their lives that they end up surpassing everyone else in love, in joy, in virtue, in productivity, in helpfulness to their fellow man. Truly in Jesus, the last become first. Oh, it's not because the rich and famous are ineligible or incapable of receiving the gospel. It's not because there's anything inherently noble about being at the bottom. People at the bottom are often at the bottom because they are enslaved to generational iniquities that keep them at the bottom. But you see, God chooses hard cases because he loves to show the world that Jesus is powerful enough to save absolutely anyone out of any kind of a mess. Paul is saying, hey, how about a little humility here? God didn't choose you because you were special. He chose you precisely because you are not special. And then he made you extra special in Jesus. 
God chose you because he loves the hard cases. God chose you because he wanted to show through you that Jesus brings beauty from ashes, that Jesus replaces mourning with joyfulness, that Jesus replaces a lifeless, dead, empty spirit with a heart that is overflowing with praise to God. A good measure of humility. Think humbly about yourself. Another appeal I see, think humbly about your leaders. Paul has a lot to say about leaders in this letter. But in the opening lines, he reminds the Corinthians that it is God who sovereignly chooses leaders and gives them authority in the church. The Corinthians had supposed that they had become wiser and more spiritual than Paul, their pastor and their father. You know, that's still a major problem in the church today. Someone has a teaching gift. Someone is used in a spiritual gift or two and quickly becomes puffed up and presumes that he is somehow exempt from the order of government that God has put in his church. Paul says, how about a little humility here? God called me to be your apostle by his sovereign choice. And you yourselves are the evidence, the infilling of the Holy Spirit that you have received is the evidence, is the confirmation that our ministry is from God. In Ephesians, he says, it is he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to mature the body and equip them for ministry. A good measure of humility. Think humbly about yourself. Think humbly about your leaders. And one more appeal I find, think humbly about your church. You know, it's good to love your church. I love Harvest Time Church. It's good to take pride in your church. I want everything we do to be excellent to the glory of God, to the honor and praise of Jesus Christ. But it's very bad to be puffed up about your church. To, the, to think that the way that you do it is the only way it can be done. Even worse is to be hypercritical of the church. The Corinthians were both of those things. And Paul is saying, hey, how about a little humility here, guys? He says some key things about the church here. One thing he says is that the church belongs to God and only to God. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, writing to the church of God in Corinth. You see, this is his church. This is his house. It's his family. It's his body. He is the head. This is his bride. Tread very softly around his bride. Don't try to take control and don't throw any rocks either. You see, Jesus regards people's treatment of his church very personally as their treatment of himself. Another key thing that Paul says is that local churches are part of something much bigger than themselves. Paul says you are called to be holy together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Corinthians had become the center of God's universe in their own minds. They were navel-gazing. They were nitpicking over every little thing going on in their itty-bitty little church. Who's in a relationship with whom? Who's out to dinner with who? Who liked my Facebook status? Who never likes my Facebook statuses but always likes hers? Who, who said what to whom? Did what to whom? Paul is saying, hey... How about a little humility here? You're important to God, but you're not the only thing important to God. You need to get out a little bit. There's a whole big world out there. There's important work to do. So let's get over ourselves and let's go get busy for Jesus. A simple recipe for unity. Start with a good measure of humility and then add to that a good measure of mission. A good measure of mission. Pastor Tate, our founding pastor, had a little saying that's a keeper. He used to say, when fishermen don't fish, they fight. And you know, that's true. The Corinthians had stopped fishing and so had started fighting. 
Listen, business people, professionals, educators, I'm going to give you a, a kingdom leadership principle this morning that will work anywhere in any setting. It can be adapted to, to anywhere that God uses you as a leader. See, you go to a leadership seminar, you pay $500 for this little bit of wisdom I'm about to give you. You get it for free in the house of the Lord this morning, all right? Here it is. The solution to the problem of division is always to cast vision for the mission. I remember when we were gearing up to build this building. And I was green. I was a new pastor trying to fill some very big shoes. And I was worried about whether or not there was really enough unity in our Harvest Time family to build this building. So I was praying one day for unity, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me as clearly as he ever had. And he said, Glenn, don't pray for unity, pray for vision. You see, the source of division is two or more competing visions in a church or in an organization. So I began to fast and pray for God's vision for harvest time. And then as I received it, I began to cast that vision. And that is precisely what Paul is doing here in the opening lines of 1 Corinthians. He raises the problem of division and then he immediately reminds them of their mission. My brothers, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you, but Christ sent me to preach the gospel, the message of Christ. That's foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is powerful to those being saved. How do we combat division by focusing on our mission? Looking at Paul's words, I see a few things that God has given us for the mission. First of all, we have been given a supernatural message. Paul says, since the world in all of it, its wisdom couldn't find God, God was pleased through the foolishness of this message to save those who believe. We preach Christ crucified to those whom God has called, a message that releases the power and the wisdom of God. Beloved, listen, we have been given a message that is intrinsically powerful. It produces results always, regardless of our speaking ability, regardless of our speaking experience, regardless of our confidence in sharing the message. The message is inherently powerful itself to produce results. You see, what Jesus did on the cross was so supernaturally powerful that the mere recounting of the facts of his substitutionary death and his bodily resurrection are enough to cause saving faith to be born into people's hearts. We have been given a message that cannot miss. We have been given a message that cannot fail to produce results. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so is my word out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish that which I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And if that weren't enough, not only have we been given a message, but we have been given supernatural authority. Paul uses two words in this chapter to refer to the authority that we have. The first word is the word apostle, which means a sent one. And the second is the word herald. Apostles and heralds are agents who are dispatched by the king. To, speech, to speak on the king's behalf with the king's authority. You see, the voice of a herald is just like the voice of the king in the ears of those to whom he has been sent. The proclamation that comes from the herald is vested with the full weight of the king's authority to establish whatever it is that he has been sent to proclaim. What would happen to us if we really understood, if we really got a grasp of the gifts that have been entrusted to us, a message that cannot miss, and authority so that our voice is like the voice of the king in the ears of people who hear us. And if that weren't enough, there's something more. I feel like Bob Barker introducing the grand prize. 
We've been given a message and the king's authority, and we've also been given supernatural gifts. Paul says you've been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and knowledge. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly await for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Paul is referring here specifically to the charismata, to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and especially the ones that relate to prophetic revelation and prophetic speech. Paul is thinking of the word of knowledge. The word of knowledge is information that is disclosed by God about someone that only God could know. Jesus was used in that gift when he met a woman at the well and God disclosed to Jesus the messy situation in her life and he said, go call your husband. And by the way, Jesus didn't send her to go get her husband because he was trying to be cruel. It was because he knew the brokenness in her life and God wanted to heal it. Jesus is thinking about the word of wisdom that's heavenly guidance from above to lead people out of their messes. He's thinking about the gift called discerning of spirits. That's the ability to identify the spiritual dynamics that are operating behind someone's circumstance. Paul operated in this gift when he identified the python spirit that was uh, working out of the little slave girl in Philippi. Paul is thinking about the gift of prophecy, the unction to speak holy words that bypass every argument and objection of a man's mind and cut right into his heart. Paul goes into detail later about these gifts of the Holy Spirit, and we shall too, but it's enough to say right now that all of these spiritual abilities have been given to us for the mission. So let's take inventory. We have been given an intrinsically powerful message. We have been given the king's authority in our voice. And we have been given supernatural gifts to discern people's innermost secrets and needs and to speak to them in a way that completely opens up their heart to receive Jesus. How boring is it to sit around and bicker when we have been given all this cool equipment for fishing? You know, it's like we've been given one of those sonars that cheaters use to tell where the fish are under the surface. It's like we've been given a stick of dynamite to toss into the water to bring all those fish up to the surface. I I'm not into this patient fly fishing one at a time. Let's get production. Let's just get the whole net full. We we've been given a net to, to haul them in. Forget about the silly little fights. Let's have some fun instead and use all this cool equipment God has given us to go get us some fish. <laughs> a simple recipe for unity. Start with a good measure of humility. Add to that a good measure of mission. And finally, top it off with a good measure of positive confession. A good measure of positive confession. Worship team, come rescue me. How many of you were believers in the 1980s? Let me see your hand. All right, some of you weren't even born in the 1980s. <laughs> but for those of you that lived through the 80s with me, maybe the word positive confession has a negative connotation. But listen, open your heart. Don't miss your blessing. Listen to what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 1. This entire chapter is remarkable. But maybe the most remarkable part is these verses in which he gives this confident thanksgiving for a church that is so seriously messed up. And believe me, as we read a little further into this letter, you'll find out it was messed up. Nevertheless, he says, I always thank God for you. Because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you've been enriched in every way, in all your speaking, in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly await for our Lord Jesus to be revealed. Listen to this. Listen, listen to this positive confession. He will keep you strong to the end. And you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you, is faithful. He will do it. How?
how can Paul say such positive things when there were so many problems in the church and things seemed to be getting worse and worse all the time? The reason that Paul could speak like that is because his confidence was not in the Corinthians, but in Jesus Christ. His confidence was in the faithfulness of God. His confidence was in the saving power of God's call. He is able to save to the uttermost those who have come to him through Jesus Christ. His confidence was in the keeping power of God's grace. Paul uses this very interesting word, guarantee. He uses it twice in this section of thanksgiving. In verse 6, he says, Our message about Christ was confirmed in you. The word is guaranteed. It's a legal term. It means a guarantee in writing, in a legal contract. God's supernatural work in the Corinthians was God's sure guarantee that the message of the cross is indeed true. And he uses that word guarantee again in verse 8. He says he will keep you strong to the end. The word is guarantee. Paul is saying God has guaranteed you a strong finish. After he makes this positive confession, he tells the Corinthians to follow him and to say the same thing. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you agree with one another. That, that, that translation in the NIV, it, it missed the mark, but the King James got it right. What Paul literally says is God has guaranteed you a strong finish so that you'll be blameless on the last day because God is faithful. And he says, I appeal to you, now speak the same thing. Paul says, you've been speaking divisive words. I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't like your stupid rules. One says, I like Pastor Paul. Another says, no, I like Pastor Apollos better. Another says, no, I like Pastor Peter better. Another says, listen, I don't listen to any of those bananas. I just follow Jesus. Paul said, stop it and speak the same things that I speak instead. What shall we confess about Harvest Time Church? Let's confess that we belong to God. Harvest Time is His church. He is the head. We are His body. Let's confess that He called us here together. He called Denise and me here in 1996. He called some of you here before that. He's called some of you here since. But He has brought us together for such a time as this. Let's confess that He placed us as a city on this hill at the top of King Street in the town of Greenwich, Connecticut. He placed us on this lamppost to shine for Him. He made a promise 31 years ago that these fields are white for harvest, that Greenwich is ripe and ready to receive Jesus. Let's confess that we're a church full of hard cases who are being radically transformed by the grace of God. We were nothing special, but God has chosen us in Christ to become something extra special. Let's confess that the presence of the Holy Spirit among us is certain evidence that the message of the cross is true. Let's confess that we've been given an intrinsically powerful message that cannot fail the King's authority and gifts to unlock the hearts of men. Let's confess that we will catch fish. Let's confess that until Jesus returns, we have been equipped with every gift of the Holy Spirit to carry forward the ministry of Jesus. By the way, this is one of the great verses in the Bible that confirms that the gifts of the Holy Spirit did not die with the apostles. Paul said, you are equipped with every good gift until Jesus comes back. <laughs> Prophecy is in this house until Jesus comes back. Words of knowledge and words of wisdom are in this house until Jesus comes back. Listen, if you're sick in body, healing is in this house until Jesus comes back. Miracles are in this house until Jesus comes back. Deliverance is in this house until Jesus comes back. Faith is in this house until Jesus comes back. 
Let's confess that in spite of our present messes, whatever they might be, we're going to make it. In spite of our challenges, we're going to make it. In spite of the mistakes we've made, we're going to make it. In spite of our deficiencies, we're going to make it. In spite of our needs, we're going to build phase two. Not because we are capable, but because our great God is faithful. Let's confess that we're going to finish strong. You have God's guarantee in writing. I am confident of this very thing that He who began a good work in you will be faithful to bring it to completion. Listen to me. You're not going to stay the way that you are. You're not going to stay in the sin messes that you're in. You're going to become the overcoming, holy person of God that he called you to be. I don't know how you're going to get there, but wherever you're at today, Paul says you're going to be ready. When Jesus comes, you're going to be ready. You're going to be washed. You're going to be have it together. You're going to be cleaned up, blood bought, Holy Ghost filled, water baptized, confessing believer. I don't know how you're going to get from here to there, but I know that God who is faithful is going to do it. What happens when divisive speech stops and we all start speaking the same thing? We all start making positive confessions. Let me give you three things real quick and we're done. What happens when we start making positive confessions? First of all, the church is restored to its original condition. Paul said, I appeal to you in the name of Jesus, speak the same things so that you might be perfectly united in attitude and in opinion. That word translated perfectly united or perfectly joined, it literally means restored to original condition. My friend Joseph and Mara Corley were here with us last night. They have a ministry in Ridgefield, Connecticut called The Upper Room. It's a prayer ministry. And Joseph just had his jubilee birthday, his 50th birthday. So Mara, his wife, got him a very special present. She bought him a vintage Volkswagen convertible bug. But the bug needed a little help. The bug needed a little work. Being an engineer, Joseph had no problem. He took it apart piece by piece and he restored the entire thing. He took out the engine. He took apart the engine piece by piece. He cleaned it. He put it back together. And here is a picture of the 40-year-old engine back in the bug in its original condition. That's what happens when we begin speaking the same thing. When we begin making positive confessions from the Word of God, it restores the church to its original condition. It restores the original enthusiasm, the original optimism, the original joyfulness, the original lightheartedness, the original easygoingness. Do you remember what it was like when you used to look forward to go to church? Do you remember what it was like when you, you couldn't wait to get there? Do you remember what it was like when, when little things just kind of rolled off your back? You know, if you came and someone was in your seat, you, you just found another seat. You didn't go off in a huff. You didn't, you didn't worry about it. You just, you remember when you had that joyful optimism uh, about the body of Christ? That's what happens when we begin speaking the same things. It restores our heart, our spirit, our mind, our attitude to its original condition. What happens when we start making positive confession? A second thing, the church grows mature in faith. That word translated perfectly united was used by Paul in his letter to the Thessalonians. He said, I long to see you face to face so that I may perfect what is lacking in your faith. See, when we all start speaking the same things, we cause our faith to grow because we are causing others to hear the word of God. Paul says, now faith comes by, come on, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Something happens to you when you hear the word of God in your ear. In order to prepare Joshua for leadership, God told Moses, 
Moses, write down everything that I did for you. Write it all down and then stand and rehearse it in the ear of Joshua. Recite it over and over again. Read it again and again in the ear of Joshua. And while Moses was reading everything God had done, while he was reading God's word in the ear of Joshua, something happened. Faith began to grow in Joshua's heart. So that when the day finally came, when he had to step up to the plate and walk into some very big shoes, and God said, don't worry, Joshua, I will be with you just like I was with Moses. Because Moses had recited everything God had done again and again in the ear of Joshua. Joshua knew exactly what he could expect. He knew exactly what he could look forward to. He knew exactly what he could anticipate when God said to him, Go over, Joshua, to the flooded Jordan. Dip your big toe in, and it's going to split in half, and you're going to walk across. Where did Joshua get the faith to do that? He got the faith to do that because he had listened to Moses reading the Word of God again and again in his ear. And he said, hey, I recognize that. God did that once before. And if God did it once before at the Red Sea, then God can do it again for me at a flooded Jordan. What happens when we start making positive confessions? The final thing is this. Our torn net is mended so that we can catch and keep fish. Paul said, I appeal to you in the name of Jesus. Speak the same things. What things? The same things that I've just said over you. Speak the same things so that rather than divisions, you are perfectly united, perfectly joined together. That word division, it literally means rips. It means tears. It means holes. That takes us to one final place where that word that's translated perfectly united appears. It's the same word that is used when Jesus found the disciples on the shore of the Sea of Galilee mending their nets. You see, divisive speech tears away at the fabric of the church. It creates holes. It severely limits our ability to catch and to keep fish. It weakens the whole church. It rips ministries to sh shreds. But positive confession, Paul's kind, repairs the net. It knits people together again. It strengthens the whole church. It significantly increases our effectiveness so that we can catch and keep more fish. And after all, that's why we're here. Harvest time, receive a word of holy encouragement from the Holy Spirit. Even in the best of churches like ours, there's always a need to grow in unity. And even in the most dysfunctional of churches, there is always hope in Christ for unity to be restored and here is the recipe, a good measure of humility, a good measure of mission, and a good measure of positive confession.